great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness torn through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living lord let's sing who could imagine who could imagine yeah so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages sent down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Thank you, Lord. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful sin, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Yeah. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on. Come on, let's declare this in victory. Then came the morn. That's right, friends. And sealed the promise. We say, your very body won't oh, begin to
This is Friends Online, with original music from Friends Worship, and a look at what the Bible says, what it means, and why it matters. With me, Jay Hewitt, and our senior pastor, Matthew Cork. We've got fresh episodes every week with exclusive content tailored specifically for our online audience. We're just a text message away, and the church has left the building. I'm glad you're with us. Let's get into this. Hey friends, words change us, don't they? I think about some of the most powerful words I've ever heard in my life. Like the day that I heard I do on my wedding day, or whenever I hear I love you from a loved one, or whenever my son just says, let's go play Legos. That's, those are good words. Uh, but words can cause us hurt and fear and confusion too. Think of the words like, you're fired, or I want a divorce. And then there are words that are never spoken but can cause the deepest pain in our life. You know, not hearing I'm proud of you from a, a parent can forever shape us. You know, we all carry wounds from words, ones that are said or unsaid. But there are three words today that I want to share with you. And these three words can uh, heal and restore broken relationships. They can change people's lives. In fact, they have changed more lives for good than any other words in human history. They have brought healing to people more than any other, and that is not an exaggeration. The reality of these three words have freed people from addiction, from guilt, from shame. They have healed relationships, and they have even been the power behind ending the slave trade and the creation of modern day hospitals. They have led people to forgive their enemies, and have led people to be inspired to create music and poetry in the arts. And today, they can change you too. So what are these three words? What are these words that can change so many people's lives in our world today? Well, turn with me to Matthew 28, 1 through 20, for us to find out. I wasn't going to tell you until you uh, read the Bible with me. And so as we get there, and as you turn to the Bible there, I want to give you some background. Uh, Jesus has just been crucified in Matthew 26 and 27. Jesus was nailed to a Roman cross. And after being unjustly tried and convicted, his closest friends uh, deserted him uh, out of fear that they too would be arrested and crucified like Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross was completely voluntary. At any moment, he could have taken himself off the cross and put everyone in their place but he chose to die on the cross for you and for me because he loves us so much. And so after seeing their hopes of Jesus end with his last breath, the disciples don't know what to do. And so let's pick it up in Matthew 28, 1 through 10. I'll begin reading in verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as the snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. So in verse two, we pick it up and the women approached the tomb and we're told in the passage that there's a violent earthquake. Now we were told a chapter earlier in chapter 27 that when Jesus uh, cried out his last breath, there was an earthquake as well. Jesus' death and his resurrection are literally shaking the foundations of earth. But the reality has for centuries also shaken the foundation of people's lives. It was Napoleon who said this, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, 
There is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But what foundation did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of people would die for him. And I love what H.G. Wells said, one of the greatest authors of all time about Jesus. He said this, I am a historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all human history. Amazing uh, quotes from some incredible leaders. Jesus' death and resurrection is literally shaking the world and our lives still today. And shake it must. Because God must shake us out of accepting that sin and brokenness is just the way the world is or just the way our life is. And out of this earthquake, an angel appears in the passage. And um, he, he rolls out the, the stone from the empty tomb. And I just want to say that the angel doesn't roll the stone to let Jesus out of the tomb. Instead, he rolls the stone away to show the women that the tomb was empty. And then in verse 5, the angel speaks to the woman. Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not there. He has risen. Come and see the place where he lay. Now, my friends, these words, these words are astonishing words. And we have to ponder them for a moment. He says again, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen. Now imagine with me for a moment what both Marys thought. Now they weren't prepared for this announcement. And walking up that day, they were feeling devastated. They were defeated. They believed that Jesus, that Jesus who they loved was completely dead. And then they hear this announcement. They peer inside the tomb and there's no one inside of it. There wasn't any body. The women were utterly surprised by what they didn't see, Jesus' body. I'm sure they wondered and pondered what it all meant. And maybe today you are new to the Christian faith or you're exploring uh, this whole idea of Christianity and you're wondering what the empty tomb means. Maybe you're here watching online for the first time in a while and you're kind of rethinking all this. And so for two minutes, let me just explain what the Bible tells us about the meaning of the resurrection and why it's so important to your life. Now, this might require a little bit more thinking than normal, but I promise you, it's the most important part of the Christian faith. You have to understand this. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. There's no point in us watching today and being here if Jesus doesn't rise from the dead. The Bible teaches that when God created the world, he created the world good and beautiful and true and right. There's no suffering, no pain. No one hurt each other, no murder and no lies and no depression and no mental illness. There is no uh, cultural wars and no politics. Work was actually enjoyable and not burdensome. But soon after, sin entered into the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And death was one of its consequences. You know, sin means separation. And because of sin, people are born into spiritual separation from God. Because of separation, people now find in themselves a destructive power and impulse to do what they want and to act selfishly rather, live, live, that rather than live for what God wants and to love others unselfishly. We also live with this guilt and the shame. And there's a deep sense of loneliness that no amount of counseling can ever free us from. But believe me, I've been through my own counseling and I still have it. But just like sin brought spiritual separation, so now death brings physical separation. You see, when we die, all people will experience physical separation from their bodies and their soul or the immaterial part of them. But here's the worst part. The worst part is that when we die without Jesus, 
because of the separation that sin brings, we will be separated from the goodness of God and his presence forever. Here's the main point. When Jesus died on the cross, he had victory over sin by suffering for its consequences, and he had victory over death by raising from the dead. And after his resurrection, we are forgiven by Jesus, and there's no longer any separation between us and God. And now, through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, we can now live as God intended for us to live in this life. And Jesus said in John 11:25, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. I wanna give an illustration to help make sense of all of this. When we and the Allies invaded Normandy on D-Day in World War II, it was the largest gathered army in modern day warfare. 156,000 troops were sent to Omaha Beach. And when we won that battle, it proved to be the turning point in the war. And from that point on, the Allies had a mopping up job of the war until the war officially ended on VE Day, or Victory in Europe Day. You see, the war had ended officially on VE Day, but the decisive victory was D-Day. And in the same way, the decisive victory was the resurrection. And now we are in a sort of mopping up job of sin and pain and death until one day Jesus will return and the full victory that he had on that day will be experienced on earth as it is in heaven. You see, friends, the empty tomb means that Jesus has victory over your sin and my sin. But what happens after a victory in war? Well, usually there is new leadership set up. When, what we believe is that when Jesus comes into our life, he sets up new leadership in our hearts and gives us a soft heart that wants to hear his voice and wants to do what he says for us to do. In fact, Jesus said in Revelation 21, 5, I am making everything new. Now I want you just to pause, friends, and just personalize that uh, verse for a moment. Jesus is making Aaron new. Jesus is making Chris new, Brittany new. Anyone who believes in Jesus is new. Put your name in that verse. We are made new when we welcome Jesus into our life. He makes our heart new and soft to others and to want to obey him and to love other people. He fills us with his love through the Holy Spirit so that we are no longer uh, alone in this life. He brings beauty out of ashes and healing out of our wounds. You see, God is making the world new again by forgiving you and me of our sin, our regrets. God is making our hearts new from the inside out. God gives us a new power to say no to temptation and sin through the Holy Spirit. And God makes our relationship with him new. The barrier between us and God is now gone and torn. And God is making even the earth new. Friends, one day, the world we live on right now will be recreated into a new earth. That's what the Bible teaches. Because of the empty tomb, we do not have to cope. We hope in the victory of the empty tomb. Now, I have a friend of mine named Greg. And Greg wasn't a Christian until he was in his 30s. And then I met him at our Alpha course. And Greg is a successful investment banker. He seemed to have everything he needed, but there was something missing. And when he began to explore Christ, every time he heard about Jesus and met Christians at a church service, he says that he felt this love that he had never known before. And when I had the chance to uh, meet with him in person, I got to lead him to Christ at King Coffee in Newport Beach. And he accepted Jesus with a sincere heart that day. Two years ago, uh, he told me, he said this, everything about me has changed now. He said, the way I use my time has changed. The way I view money has changed. The way I see myself as a husband has changed. The way I treat my body has changed. Everything has changed. Greg's life as a 35-year-old banker is new. He had everything, it seemed like, but he 
was missing Jesus, and now he has a new heart. So let's continue on. Look down in verses 8 and 9 with me. It says that the women continued on, they hurried away with joy, and suddenly as they were running, they met Jesus, or rather Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his, his feet, picture that, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. When the women see Jesus, they don't just see the empty tomb. They see the risen Christ, and they fall at his feet in worship, and they clasp his feet with their hands to make sure he's not a ghost. Like Jesus is real. He's really alive. And they, they grabbed his feet uh, as they lay on the ground as if they had found a treasure that they wouldn't let go of. And guess what they had? You see, Jesus isn't just a doorway to forgiveness and to go to heaven. The empty tomb also means you get a personal relationship with Jesus himself. Jesus is the reward, you see, friends. This is a series that we've been in called Simply Jesus. And that is why we call it that, friends. The reward for believing in Jesus is Jesus. You get a relationship with him. And my prayer this message is that if you've ever heard this before, that today you will hear it afresh for the first time. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is risen. He is alive right now. And he is the treasure of your life. And he's the reward. It's not Jesus and, it's simply Jesus. Jesus is enough for you. And maybe you think that the women at the tomb were just lucky and they got uh, to see Jesus in person and we get like a second-rate version of Jesus because we weren't there in person. But I want to draw attention to how the angel describes Jesus in verse 5. He says in verse 5, Jesus who was crucified. But in the original Greek language, it says Jesus, the crucified one. And the language is written in the perfect tense, which describes an ongoing result as a result of a completed action. In other words, the results of Jesus dying on the cross will forever have results in the people who believe in him for eternal life from the day the women fell at his feet in worship until right now at this moment in your life. Which means... You and I don't get a second-rate Jesus. Right now, you can really experience Christ and know him personally. I received a note this week from an old friend. He was a, one of my former college students when I was a college pastor. And he went through some very serious uh, struggles, emotional, mental, in his 20s. But he believed in Jesus and he believed that the resurrection was going to help him through it. And it was true for him as it was for the women on that day when they fell at his feet. And so he wrote me this week, actually as I was preparing for this talk, and it was out of the blue, and this is what he said. He said, I am at the point that I believe that God lives and he can do the impossible. I believe that he speaks to us and reveals things to us that are needed in and through any social setting at any time by the Spirit for people to know that his son was raised from the dead. My friend experienced Jesus alive right now to help him through his tough times as the women did that day. Now, you might be wondering, how does that happen? How do you know that Jesus personally today as the women did on Easter morning? Well, Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Holman Hunt is a pre-Raphaelite artist who painted a picture called Light of the World depicting that very verse. And it's going to come up on the screen as um, I talk about it. And on this picture, um, it depicted this very verse. Jesus is at the door of a house knocking and he's standing outside the door and that door and that house represents your life. Jesus is knocking at the door of your life and the passage says, that if you welcome him, him in, if you open the door to him, that he will come in and he will eat with you. 
That's what it means to, uh, to, 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 to be a friend of Jesus, to have a meal with him, to enjoy him, to enjoy his presence. To be a Christian means to be a friend and a follower of Jesus and to enjoy his presence. And the passage says that if you welcome him in, he will come in. Now, when Holman Hunt made this uh, painting, people saw it and they said, it's a great painting, we love it, but you made a mistake. And Holman was like, what are you talking about? And they pointed out that there was only one doorknob in the picture and that Holman had left off a doorknob on the outside of the door. And Holman replied back to them, it's not a mistake. I did that intentionally. There's only one doorknob in this picture and it's on the inside. You see friends, Jesus isn't going to force his way into your life. For you to personally experience him, you have to welcome him in. You have to open the door of your heart, of your life to him and say, come on in my life. And if you do, the passage says, I will come in. Jesus didn't say, I might come in or I'll wait and I'll think about it. Jesus said, I will come into your life. And this relationship that you get with him is not just for eternity in the future, it's right now, but it will never end. It'll last all the way into eternity. And so that's how you have a relationship beyond this life with Jesus. You welcome him in, into your life. Now I realize that some of you might not be ready to welcome Jesus in right now. Maybe you are cautious and you want to investigate more and more of the facts. And maybe you wonder, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Like, is that true or is that like a myth? Well, just like there is misinformation um, happening in our day, there is mis misinformation in Jesus' day as well. Look at verses 11 through 15 with me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and they told them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews this very day. This story was made up by the Jewish leaders who wanted to cover up the story of Jesus' resurrection. They bribed the Roman guards into claiming that they fell asleep and stole, and the disciples stole Jesus' body. This claim sought to cover the truth of Jesus' resurrection. So let's not have a straw man with Jesus' resurrection. Let's look at the major modern day objections to whether or not the resurrection occurred. According to uh, Pastor Lee Strobel, objection number one, was Jesus really dead? Like, did he really die? Yes, he really did die. Historians consider Jesus' death on the cross to be a non-controversial fact as the Journal of American Med Associ Association concluded. The historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was ever inflicted. Objection number two, did believers invent this story? No. Legends often take two or three generations to create and to take shape. But we have hard evidence that an early report of the resurrection was formed within months of the resurrection as outlined by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 2 through 7. Objection three, was the tomb really empty? Yes, even the opponents of Jesus implicitly conceded the tomb was empty that first Easter morning. In fact, so sure they were that the tomb was empty that they claimed Christ's disciples stole his body. Objection four, did the Romans steal the body? No, the Romans didn't have a motive for stealing the body. They wanted Jesus dead. Jesus, uh, the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day didn't have a motive either. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. And the disciples didn't have the means nor the opportunity to steal the body. Objection five, did people actually see Jesus alive? Yes. Now we have nine ancient sources outside and inside the New Testament that collaborate the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. 
Now, this is an avalanche of historical evidence. And what's more is that we have the earliest reports that says that 500 people saw him at the same time. Objection six, did the disciples hallucinate? No, hallucinations do not happen in groups, only in individuals. Lee Strobel goes on to conclude after his investigation of Jesus, if the resurrection of Jesus is true, then his teachings are not just wise words from an old dead sage. They are the very words of God. His resurrection means that he is still alive and we can encounter him today. And because of his atoning death on the cross, all those who follow him have received forgiveness for the sins and heaven is open to all of us. The resurrection truly changes everything. And so what three words can change us more than any other? What three words have brought more healing and life change than any other words? Those three words are, he is risen. He is risen. And it is true. And it changes everything. And it can change you too. For some, it might be time today to open the door of your life and let Jesus in and become a follower of Jesus. And I hope you will. I plead that you will. And I don't mean just to be a fan of Jesus. I mean to be a follower of Jesus. That's what the world needs. Someone who orients their entire life around Jesus and believes in him for life and for love. You know, I get the sense as I prepared this talk today that Jesus is knocking on the door of some of your hearts. And it's time. And if you're ready today, I want to lead you in a moment of response to believe in the resurrected living King Jesus. It's a very simple prayer. It's just a please and a thank you kind of prayer. But it has to be sincere. And the prayer doesn't save you. Your faith in Jesus saves you. And so right now, right wherever you're at, would you just take a moment and pray with me out loud or in your heart this very simple prayer. Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Please, I welcome you into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you for resurrecting and having victory over sin. And if there's anything coming into your mind that you might need to confess in your heart to God right now, any past regrets or decisions, would you just take a moment to confess those things to God? And then would you continue on? Lord Jesus, I confess my sin. I repent and I believe in you. I believe you died and that you love me. Come into my life. I welcome you, Jesus. Come in and lead my life. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that if you prayed that prayer today, you are a child of God, that you are filled with his presence and that you belong to him. There is a song I know.
everyone, uh, I've got a couple of secrets to the Christian faith that you need to know that come out of this passage. In verses 16 through 20, Jesus gives uh, what's called the Great Commission. And he, he says these words um, in verse 18 and 20, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I've commanded you to do and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, um, number one, if you have welcomed Jesus into your life today and you put your faith in him, Jesus did not intend for you to do this alone. Um, I can't, uh, you know, stress that enough. It can't just be you and Jesus. It's a community of people. And so we want to celebrate with you. Jesus said in this passage that we are to baptize, to teach, to help people obey him in his final words. And if you want to be baptized today because of your response to Jesus, simply text the number on the screen, 714-942-4604, and let us know, and we would love to connect with you and follow up. And if you pray to welcome Jesus into your life today, and you just want to let us know that, we would love that as well. And you can text the same number. Just text us, I'm ready to follow Jesus, and text us that number, and let us know that you prayed that too. Secondly, since Jesus is alive as Christians, Jesus says, now we're to go and make disciples. So go. The Great Commission is for us to make disciples and to go. Jesus is sending you to be a witness to others that Jesus is alive. So go, go to foreign countries if you must. Sell everything, right? Give it away, who cares? Go tell your neighbors. Go do radical things in the name of Jesus that make him look really good. Be a healer and encourager. Build bridges to others. Help others be reconciled to others and to God. Build relationships with people that are different than you. Learn about them, bless them, and then when the Holy Spirit allows, um, share Jesus with them and how he is a fulfillment of their lives and their hopes and offers himself to them. The Great Commission isn't for just full-time church workers. It's for you. It's for everyone. Every Christian is called to make disciples. Why? Because he is risen. Got questions? Check out friends.church alpha, where you can start your journey towards faith by joining a discussion group. It's open, it's informal, it's full of people just like you asking questions that really matter in life. If you're looking for a church home, check out friends.church slash locations where you can find the Friends Church closest to you. You've checked us out online, now let's meet in person. We'd love to have you. Until then, subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and if anything you saw today blessed you, pass on the blessing to some friends by sharing our content. Until next time, be blessed. <laughs>